Welcome again. Right now in our reading, we are at Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Okay, and this is Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. Okay, so we're right on the verge of the crucifixion here. Let's get into this. Verse 39. He came out and went, as his custom was, to the Mount of Olives. His disciples also followed him. Jesus' custom here was to go to the Mount Mount of Olives and pray. So, you know what? In your walk with God, in your walk with the Lord, you should have a custom when you go to a certain place and pray. Wherever, Wherever it is, find a good place to pray and go there. Make it your you know, your favorite place. Verse 40. When he was at the place, he said to them, pray that you don't enter into temptation. Remember, that's one of the things, the the Lord's prayer. He does not into temptation. Verse 41. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Let me say this. Jesus is our example. Okay? And as a Christian, if you are a true believer in him, if you truly follow him, you need to take his example seriously. This means crucifixion for you, so to speak. Okay? This means Jesus said you must deny yourself in order to follow him. Deny your lust, deny your will, deny your, you know, your, your, your future plans, deny even your own life, deny your reputation. You got to deny everything. You've got to die, so to speak, in, you know, die to yourself. Be selfless, not selfish. Be selfless without an inkling of so-called self in you, Okay. And this is painful. Uh, Giving up that sin may be painful. Uh, Stopping that sin may be painful. Admitting that sin may be painful. Jesus never said it would be a walk in the park. He never said it would be like a, you know, a, a flower bed of roses. In fact, he said it was going to be tough in more and more than one place. Uh, being a true follower of Jesus is a challenge beyond all challenges because, uh, you know, we are more than conquerors uh, through him. That means that, you know, in the history of the world, there were many conquerors who lived. They conquered kingdoms. They've, they conquered cities. They conquered a lot of people. But what's even greater than that is conquering yourself conquering sin and living holy, blameless, righteous in God's eyes. And yes, it is possible. John said that he who sins is of the devil. The Torah, near the end of the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, Moses uh, recorded that God said very clearly, you know, after, after all the commandments were given, he said, this is not too hard for you. Again, John said in his letter, uh, the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. Okay? That means the Torah is not bur- burdensome. God is a loving God. He always was a loving God for his people. And so would a loving God, would a God of freedom as he was, a God who delivered his people out of the bondage of Egypt, Say, oh, no, I went through all of this trouble. I went through all of this just to make you guys free and then turn around you know, in a few days and say, oh, thanks for coming out of Egypt. I made you all free. Now I'm going to put you in bondage again by, by, by putting all these commandments on you. No. The Torah is the law of freedom, is the law of liberty. That's what the Bible calls the law of liberty. So in order for us to obey the law of liberty, Fully, we must sacrifice ourselves, so to speak. We must sacrifice our own, our own desires, our own lusts, our own will. And this is what Jesus did at, at, you know, right here at the Mount of Olives. He said, "Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me." Nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to die to self, so to speak. Take up the cross. It may be hard. 
It may be hard to give up that sin. Very hard. It may be very hard to admit that sin. It may be very hard to walk away from it and be free of it. But you must pray like Jesus prayed. Father, you know, this is hard. Take it away from me if you if you will. If you will, just let me just let me, you know, go on in in this in this earthly state that I'm in, or in this in this bondage that I'm in, the sin that I'm in. You know, if you it, can, I just go on in it. Nevertheless, not my will. I I may not like the idea of being crucified. I may not like the idea of sacrificing myself on the altar. I may not like the idea of giving up all of my sin. But not my will, Father, but yours be done. See, Jesus humbled himself. It's all about humility. It says that Jesus humbled himself un- and became obedient unto death. It says in Micah, what does God require of you, O man? That you do justly, that you walk humbly with your God. You love mercy, you do justly, and you walk humbly with your God. That's what Micah says. In order to walk humbly, you've got to be obedient. In order to be obedient, you've got to walk humbly. It comes, it goes hand in hand. But it's not a walk in the park. It's not a piece of cake all the time. You can be perplexed like Jesus was here before the, before the crucifixion. He said, Lord, Lord, oh, Father, oh, God, no, no, no. But not my will, your, your will be done. If you want me to give this up, I'll give it up. If you want me to do this in repentance, I'll do it. I humble myself and I'll do it. Verse 43. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. This is what happens when you are at that point of dying to yourself, dying to that sin. God will send angels to help you. God, if you really turn from that sin, if you really repent and you really say, Father, oh Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Take this sin from me. God will go out of his way to answer that prayer. You really pray, you really pray, you know, hard and strong to be free from sin and to be righteous and to, and to obey his, his commandments. And you're honest and, you, and, and you know, you're, you're diligent you're persistent. God will honor that prayer. Here, he honored Jesus' prayer by sending an angel. He could send an angel to you too to help you and strengthen you. Verse 44. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. He prayed more earnestly. Oh, yeah, an angel came to strengthen him. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Now, there, there are historical accounts I've read of other people that have been stressed out that much as well. You think of, you think about stress. You know, people talk about stress. <laughs> they, haven't, they haven't experienced stress like that before. They haven't been so stressed out that they sweat drops of blood. Uh, here we have an account of Jesus, that happening to Jesus. And like I said, there are historical accounts of other people experiencing that, where they have sweat, that blood has actually broken out. Uh, in, in they, they have broken out in a sweat of blood. Verse 45, when he rose up from his prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was speaking, a crowd appeared. He who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas... Do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? So that's what we need to do. We need to be very strong against sin. We need to be very strong. Set our, set our goal, set our mind on righteousness, on doing what God said to do. You know, and having the righteousness of God, having the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Jesus, doesn't mean that, you're, that you have some kind of invisible thing on. And that's what some Christians believe. They say, well, I have the righteousness of Christ because I believe in him, because I said the sinner's prayer, because I'm clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Really isn't. The righteousness of Christ means that you are in uh, you are in tune with his righteousness. You are doing what he would have done. You know, what would Jesus do? WWJD, what would Jesus do? 
having your own righteousness means that you, what you believe is right is different than what Jesus says is right. What you believe is right is different than what God said is right. And what you believe is right and wrong is, is different than what God said is right and wrong in the scriptures. Okay, your righteousness might be different than God's righteousness because your righteousness is what you think, what you feel is right and wrong. Whereas go by what God said is right and wrong. That's God's righteousness. You, if you have the righteousness of God, it means you're going by that law, not the law of your own mind, not the law of the corrupt Christian gospel as we've heard so much in recent years being preached. Okay, I believe in the true first century the true first century Christian way, okay? Let's go right back to, let's go right back to the source, okay? Go back to the source, then you'll find purity. Go back to the source of the river, you'll find pure waters. You go downstream, as the further you go downstream, the more it's going to be polluted. So I don't want to, I don't want you to be polluted. I want you to be full of the pure word of God, not polluted by anything else. So join me. As I go through these scriptures and uh, and you know look at it from a first century point of view, this is very very vital. It was written in the first century. If you don't read it from a first century mind, Jewish mind at that, you're gonna misread it. You're gonna misunderstand it for sure. It's just it's, that's just, <laughs> that's just a given. So as you seek God. May he enlighten the eyes of your understanding and give you revelation beyond all your peers. And, and, and as you call upon him, may he show you great and mighty things in the name of Jesus. Amen.